In our last session together, I asked you to give me a chance to explain why my teaching from Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, is a little bit different than what you typically hear from prophecy teachers. I'm going to ask that of you again today. Give me the benefit of the doubt and just follow with me through some of my reasoning. We are in Daniel chapter number 9, verses 24 and 25, which talk about a total of 490 years passing from the time of a decree to rebuild Jerusalem, including its walls, until the Messiah should be on the scene. These verses are the reason why people in the time of the New Testament were so hyped up about Jesus and before him, John, uh, being potential messiahs. They were positive. They had to be living in the time of of the Messiah because of this timing. Well, most of the prophecy teachers want to start the countdown clock in 445 or 444, which is the one I think is the better date, uh, the year that Nehemiah was given a decree by King Artaxerxes of Persia to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. But immediately, these prophecy teachers run into a problem because that timing shoots you right past the time of Jesus, just by a few years, but it does shoot you past. So what they did was they massaged the numbers. I actually think they pretzeled the numbers. They twisted them too much. Uh, And they came up with this concept of a 360-day prophetic year which does not exist in Scripture or in Jewish society. Uh, And even with that, they still had an extra seven left over, so they had to push that into the future, into the time of the book of Revelation, where, in fact, there is no mention of a seven-year period in the book of Revelation. If you don't believe me, check it. It's not there. There's a a three-and-a-half-year period that's mentioned, but not a seven-year period. Well, This is all resolved easily enough if you start the countdown clock just a few early uh, years earlier than Nehemiah. And I think this is the proper place to do it. And I told you that Ezra is the one that we should be looking at as starting this clock. Uh, The story of Ezra starts in the book of his name, Ezra, chapter number 6, where he goes from Babylon to Jerusalem as a priest scribe with the law books to reestablish properly the worship of God at the temple. And he has with him an official decree of the Persian king Artaxerxes to do whatever he feels is appropriate. And apparently, one of the things that he felt was appropriate was to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Because uh, in his uh, own uh, writings, in his own history, he thanks God that a wall has been reestablished along with the temple. Uh, And let me give my evidence for that. Ezra chapter 9 Uh, Verse number nine is part of the prayer of Nehemiah, excuse me, of Ezra uh, after he's been in country for several months. This is what it says. For we are slaves, yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. So he was already praying and talking about this wall that was going up around the holy city in the year 458 B.C. So that's quite a few years uh, before 
Nehemiah got permission. So what happened in between? Uh, Well, we know what happened in between because that's also in the book of Ezra. Uh, It's in a separate section of letters, uh, but uh, let me get the proper place here. Ezra chapter number 4, starting at verse number 7. Ezra chapter 4, verse number 7. It says, In the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam and Mithradath and Tabil, the rest of their associates, wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. The letter was written in Aramaic and then translated. Rehum, the commander, Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their associates, the judges, the governors, uh, and uh, uh, the... I'm sorry, I lost my spot. Here we go. The governors, the officials, the Persians, uh, the men of Eric, the Babylonians, the men of Susa, uh, that is the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapper deported and settled in the cities of Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river. Uh, This is a copy of the letter that they sent to Artaxerxes the king. Your servants, the men of the province beyond the river, send greetings. And now, be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. So they are actually describing what had happened when Ezra and his people arrived at Jerusalem. They started rebuilding the walls of the city. Verse 13. Now, it be it known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they won't pay tribute customer toll and the royal revenue will be impaired. Now, because we eat the salt of the palace and it's not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor, therefore we send and inform the king in order that a search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, and you will find in the book of the records and learn that this city is a rebellious city, hurtful to kings and provinces, and that sedition is stirred up in it from of old. And that is why this city was laid waste. We make known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls finished you will then have no possession in the province beyond the river. Uh, Now, the rest of the uh, passage goes through and talks about how uh, the king does a check. He finds out that there was rebellion here. And then uh, he writes uh, back to them uh, this, verse 21. Therefore, make a decree that these men be made to cease and that this city be not rebuilt until a decree is made by me. Take care not to be slack in this matter. Why should damage grow to the herd of the king? So he orders that the wall rebuilding effort under Ezra be stopped. And it stays stopped until Nehemiah when Nehemiah gets specific permission from this exact same king, by the way, to rebuild the walls. Uh, But the fact that it was stopped doesn't change what was required in the Daniel 9 passage. And that is that a decree be issued that the walls be rebuilt. That happened in the time of Ezra. So we should start our clock in that time of Ezra, which would be the fall of 457 B.C. The first period of seven-year cycles starts in that year and runs through the fall of 408 B.C. And we know historically and we'll be looking at it, God willing, in our studies as we continue. Uh, During that time period, the city of Jerusalem was completely rebuilt, rewalled, and repopulated. Then, the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse number 25, says there would be a further 62 sevens. 
So 62 cycles of sabbatical years. That's a total of 434 years added to the original 49. It would span from the fall of 408 BC until the fall of AD 27. And then according to the text of Daniel chapter 9, the Messiah is going to be on the scene by that time. And guess what? Jesus was alive in the Holy Land in A.D. 27. Now let's get back to our uh, text in Daniel and see what else it says. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. After the 62 sevens, so that'd be after the total of 483 years since Ezra started rebuilding the walls. After the 62 sevens, the anointed will be executed without any basis for condemnation in him. Now, in the literal language of this passage, it says that the anointed one is going to be cut off. Uh, But since uh, we've got mention here of it being Uh, when there was no reason for him to be condemned, uh, it's clearly being um, portrayed as an execution. So that's why I use the word executed. And that's exactly what happened. We know that after his three-and-a-half-year ministry, Jesus was arrested, put on trial. Uh, He was accused of things that were not accurate, didn't matter. Uh, his condemnation was steamrolled through. There was no reason for him to be condemned, and yet he still was and was executed. So it fits perfectly with the uh, description we see here. Uh, Then we read this, the city and the holy place will be ruined along with the coming leader. They will be cut off in a flood, and until the end, desolating war is determined. So this is the thing that probably bothered Daniel. Uh, He started this whole thing by Bible study about how the desolation of Jerusalem in his time was going to be reversed after 70 years. And so Daniel's praying about that coming to an end. And then God tells him, guess what? After another 70 period, that is a 70 sabbatical year cycles period, The Messiah is going to be cut off, and then because of that, the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed again, and so will the rebuilt temple be destroyed again. Uh, Now, in your English Bibles that you've got probably in front of you right now, it says something like this. The city and the holy place will be destroyed by the prince, excuse me, by the people of the prince that is to come. Now, I don't go with that translation, uh, and here's my reason why. The word people in Hebrew is ham, but the preposition with is im, and in Hebrew, of the ancient time, those two words looked exactly the same. You have to decide which is meant. Uh, They're actually related words because people are the ones you're with. But you had to determine, is it a preposition or a noun? And our English translators, for whatever reason, have gone with the noun. Whereas... I found a Greek translation of the Old Testament, a Septuagint, that translated it as a preposition. That's what sent me down this road many years ago. Uh, And what happens is, if you translate it as a preposition, it means that the city and the temple's fate is tied to the fate of the Messiah. If the Messiah had lived then the temple and the city would have remained. But because the Messiah is cut off, because the Messiah is executed without cause, then judgment falls upon the 
city of Jerusalem and upon the temple. And we know that Jesus puts it pretty much that way. Uh, on the day of his triumphal entry, uh, Jesus cried over the city. Why did he cry? Uh, because of the fact that he could see the destruction of the city of Jerusalem prophetically in the future. And it was because they did not recognize the time of its visitation, uh, which is the way that, it's a Hebrew way of saying they didn't recognize they were being evaluated. They didn't recognize that they were being tested to see whether or not they would do the God thing, which would be to accept the Messiah. And they didn't. So what this prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 was trying to warn the Jewish people about well ahead of time was when the Messiah shows up, the fate of the city and the temple will be tied to his fate. And of course, we are he, God, already knew that they would reject the Messiah and therefore the temple was going to be destroyed. Uh, now, another thing that my translation is going to distinguish from the common English translations is that the coming leader in this verse is the Messiah, whereas the prophecy teachers will try to make this coming leader the Antichrist, as they refer to him, uh, the troublemaker in the book of Revelation tied up with the beast. Uh, I don't think that's a proper uh, grammatical approach to this. You see the word leader there uh, in verse 26? Uh, you see it probably as the word prince. That's the exact same word that was in the previous verse, verse 26, about the Messiah. So why would it suddenly change in just a, a, about 12, 13, 14 words? It's the same personage. The Messiah, verse 25, is the coming leader of verse 26. But because he's rejected, because he's cut off without condemnation being in him, desolation comes on the city and on the temple. And it's going to come like a flood. Uh, the Jewish people well understood this idea of flash floods. And so that's what it was going to be like. And then until the end, this desolating war is going to come. Uh, we know that Jerusalem, this is Luke that actually gives us this information, that Jerusalem was going to be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles was fulfilled. Uh, the time of the Gentiles started with the desolation of Jerusalem in AD 70, and it continues to this very day. Jerusalem is not completely under control of Jewish people even to this day. It doesn't take long to figure that out because Jewish people are not allowed to go up onto the Temple Mount and pray. They are forced to stay down in the Western Wall area and do their prayers. So there are still Gentile Muslims that have control of the Temple Mount. So it's still being trodden underfoot by Gentiles. And that's not going to stop until shortly before the second coming of Jesus. I, I believe it's not going to stop until the coming of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. Let's continue with uh, the rest of our uh, chapter 9. Verse number 27 starts with a pronoun. He will strengthen a covenant with many for one seven. Now, the popular way of translating this uh, or understanding this uh, today is that this refers back to the coming leader in verse 26, and they believe that that's the Antichrist, the bad guy in the book of Revelation. And uh, they will then hypothesize this idea of some sort of seven-year peace treaty being presented by this, uh, uh, this ungodly leader uh, to Israel, and then he will violate that halfway through. That's the typical way that they approach it. 
That's not the way that I approach it, because I believe that the leader in verse 26 is also the same as the leader in verse 25, which is the Messiah. So the he at the beginning of verse 27, I believe, is the Messiah. The Messiah will strengthen a covenant with many for one seven. Now, what does that mean? Well, you remember in the timing of the countdown that the 483 years before Messiah comes on the scene finishes in the fall of A.D. 27. And that leaves one final seven-year period from the fall of A.D. 27 to the fall of A.D. 34. What happened during that time? Well, in 28 A.D., which was during the first year of that final seven-year cycle, John the Immerser began his prophetic ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. That's how we know it happened in the, in the beginning of A.D. 28. What did John come and do? He tried to strengthen people's connection to God. He tried to strengthen the covenant relationship between people and God. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, and the prophecies about John was that he was going to turn the hearts of of the children back to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers back to the children. So John the Immerser's ministry was one of trying to re-establish a strong covenant uh, between God and the people. Well, John's immersion ministry went on through uh, the next couple of years until finally in the winter of 29 going into 30, John immersed Jesus as high priest. And the Holy Spirit comes down and lands on him like a dove, and that's the sign to John, this is the one. And immediately, Jesus begins his ministry the following Passover of A.D. 30. And for the next three and a half years of his life, from his immersion until his ascension, that's three and a half years, half of a seven-year period. For three and a half years, what is he doing? He is trying to get people to repent because the kingdom is at hand, that they need to be reestablished in their relationship with God. So Jesus also was involved in the strengthening of the covenant. And then that leaves uh, the year after Jesus died and rose again and ascended. What happened next? In the summer of A.D. 33, the church is born at Pentecost. And then it is persecuted for a while, largely at the hands of a young man named Saul of Tarsus. But then what happens with him? In the summer of 34, he is called by Jesus Christ in the... F- now, this is the final post-resurrection appearance of Jesus, by the way. He appears to Paul on the road to Damascus and makes him into the apostle to the Gentiles, the guy that's going to be responsible for taking the good news into the Gentile world. And That all together, all of that information, starting in 27 and going through 34, that's the final seven-year period of this 490-year period in the book of Daniel chapter number 9. And that seven-year period was all devoted to strengthening the covenant, the new covenant, into people's hearts and minds. Continuing in uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, the next thing it says is, within half of the seven, so that's three and a half years, so during the seven-year period, half of that period, three and a half years, my sacrifice and drink offering will be removed. Now, the more modern prophecy teachers say, well, see, that's another thing that the Antichrist does. 
there's this rebuilt temple and he goes in there and he abandons the covenant deal that he made for seven years and he stops the sacrifices, he stops the drink offerings, and he just causes trouble. Well, since I don't believe that 27 is about uh, the Antichrist, but rather about the Christ, the real one, what do I believe about this? I believe the same thing the book of Hebrews says, that Jesus terminated the need for sacrifices. He was the fulfillment of all the sacrificial uh, system. It didn't matter that the Jewish people in the temple were still sacrificing after Jesus' death and resurrection because it was no longer tied to uh, the need for salvation because Jesus provided salvation by his death and resurrection. Uh, So Jesus literally put a stop to the need for sacrifices. That's what I believe that this passage was predicting. Now the rest of it is tied in then with the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, As we already read in verse 26, uh, the fate of the temple, the fate of the city, were tied to the fate of the Messiah. And once he was executed during this final period of the 490 years, the fate of Jerusalem and the temple was sealed. They were going to be destroyed. And Jesus had already been talking about this uh, in his uh, Olivet Discourse, where he references this very part of the book of Daniel, where he says that the trigger event that the apostles should be keeping their eye open for, for, was the abomination of desolation, which Luke 21 says is armies at Jerusalem, Roman armies at Jerusalem, were going to desolate it. And so Daniel chapter 9 finishes with this, upon the temple will come an abomination of desolations, that's the armies of Rome, until the end the pouring out of desolation is determined. So the fate of the temple is sealed according to this prophecy.